can see the numbers going up. So welcome. Yeah, Carrie, I'm glad you invited them all to play foosball with me here. Yeah, Jeff, I am so surprised. Yesterday we had an event with you and there was all kinds of great conversation and no one asked you about that big foosball behind you. Is that something that you use a lot? Uh, you know, I think it's intimidating to people and I'd like to say I use it more. I use it mainly to place books and other things behind me so that they're in my videos. It's kind of just a table to, to put things on and people are thinking, oh, if you own a foosball table, you must be really good at it. And uh, I'm not. My wife is pretty good at it. She could beat anyone in this house. Um, but yeah, hopefully we start using it more instead of just putting stuff on top of it. But, you, you know, know, well, this is where this is where I sit for videos. For people like us that do these events, that's called sponsorship activation. That's where there you, you put things from your sponsors to show them off. That's right. Good morning, everyone. Generally use the chat. We will be happy to see that everyone has joined and that we're ready to go. Um, I think that this is our first webinar. So we're kind of getting a sense for how things work. Um, everybody is present author-wise. Kate has set us up and I think it's probably time to go ahead and get started. So welcome thank you for joining us this morning we have a special event with 10 authors introducing their new books a few have already been released some aren't out yet we have gallery quest links for everybody so i'll be sharing that throughout the event uh, let's see this is day two of spring forward our spring event designed to introduce booksellers to new authors and to bring you a little bit of education um this is day two in the morning um Today at 1 p.m. we have a social media panel with Kathy Ellen, who did a part one yesterday. Part two today we'll be looking at specific Meba stores social media and talking about what works well. And at 5 p.m. today we have a author genre panel, the woman of genre, six people paired together with um, the senior marketing director at William Morrow, Tavia Kowalchuk. She will be our host. I will put the links for those events in chat as we go on. So I'll be doing a little bit of that and Jeff will, will take it away in terms of introducing our authors. Jeff is the producer of Books and Bars, a very popular book club here in the Twin Cities. And it's been such a pleasure to watch him in action over the years. And it finally dawned on me that we should work together. And so this is the first year we've done it and I'm thrilled that we have. So thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Um, just go ahead and start the event for us. All right. Thanks for having me, Carrie. Uh, yeah, I'm a longtime attendee of the Book Expo uh, run by uh, Maiba. And uh, so it's been great to work with you on this project. But uh, it's breakfast time. So good morning. Hope you have a cup of coffee. Uh, I usually have two each morning. I try to cut myself off by 10 a.m. Otherwise, I'm not going to sleep. So um, I'm fired up, ready to go. Hopefully you are. Um, we have a tight four minutes for each author. So I'm not going to play you off with music like the Academy, but I will uh, jump in if, you've, if you're at the four minute mark. So uh, then I'll move on to the next author and we'll all come back for a Q and A afterwards. Uh, don't forget to uh, turn on your video and your audio when it's your turn and make sure you mute yourself when it's not your turn, okay? Uh, I'm really excited for this first one. She has an improv comedy background so you know it's gonna be good. This is Jana L. Goodwin with Traveler's Tales, The End of the World Notwithstanding, Stories I Live to Tell. Jana, you've got your suggestion. Tell us about your book. Good morning, uh, Midwest Independent Booksellers. And it looks like a happy 40th birthday to me by this year, so cheers to that. This is my very first book event as a new author. And I'm so excited to be here because booksellers, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, you are what is holding back the decline and fall of civilization. So please, please keep doing that. We are all very much obliged. So back in 2016, I put together an hour long solo comedy piece and I performed it at a few venues, uh, United Solo in New York, the wonderful Marsh Theater in San Francisco and a couple of places around Denver. I called it, you are reminded that your safety is your own responsibility. And it was a series of what I like to think of as white knuckle stories of true adventure and survival. My mother's only comment after she saw the show was I had no idea you were so jumpy. And she did know that, just like she knew that I have to pee all the time. Um, those were not actual revelations, but there were some revelations in the piece 
And there are also in my book, The End of the World Notwithstanding, Stories I Live to Tell, which was developed from that script and recently published by the wonderful people at Traveler's Tales. It starts in a cabin in Wyoming where a forest fire comes way too close in my estimation for comfort. There and in the following chapters, I confront mortality and think about, you know, when I'm not just flat out panicking, think about the various tensions that inflect our everyday lives, but maybe don't become salient until we are threatened. A few of the characters besides friend and family, because it's a memoir, include wildlife. And in particular, this one super mean kitten, a guy who lives in our alley, a famous politician, uh, the explorer Juan de Fuca, for whom the tectonic plate is named that will destroy the Pacific Northwest. Also some insects, a wild boar and more. The stories intertwine around a philosophical framework, sort of, kind of, for the big ideas are one geological time puts angst into perspective. So go where you can see strata. Two, when you stare into the abyss and the abyss stares back, say hello. Three, may we find when possible the comedy and as my acting teacher often advised when I sucked on stage, which I did, uh, find the love. He said, find the love in any scene that you are playing. And that turns out to be a transferable skill. And it's one of the book's main themes. And four, when you get off the shuttle at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, it, the bus driver says over the intercom, remember your safety is your own responsibility. Watch your step and have a great day. Boom, that's my thesis. And a bonus takeaway, it doesn't hurt to keep on you at all times, Neosporin, a Q-tip, and a Band-Aid. That's the end of the world notwithstanding, stories I live to tell. It's stuff that happened to me, some of it exciting, and reflections on being alive, which I hope amount to an entertaining read, a few nail biting moments, some laughs, and maybe a mutual acknowledgement of the terrible, terrible wonder of it all. Thank you. Thank you, Jana, sounds great. Next we have available from Turner Key Light Books, The Hive by Melissa Scholes Young. Melissa, talk to us. Good morning, Jeff. Thank you to Carrie for organizing and Jeff for hosting this fantastic event. Um, my family and I return to the Midwest every summer for 4th of July, as I'm pretty sure you're required to do if you're from the Midwest. And I can't wait to be back um, on the Mississippi River Bank for fireworks. So my novel is The Hive, and it is a story of class in America and the fates of four sisters and their family business in a politically divided Midwestern town. And I, I'm so excited to be able to show you an ARC of it. It has this beautiful cover and it sort of glows and it's inviting you into the hive, so don't resist it. I, I wrote The Hive because I've seen political and personal struggles rift our hometowns and our communities, our families, and they are occurring on the dirt road that I grew up in in rural Missouri and on the campus where I teach in Washington, DC. And the Feller family endures similar threats um, and they have to find a way to rebuild what they have in common to um, put the foundation that's been shattered back together. Um, as research for the Hive, I actually attended prepper camp, which is a real thing. Uh, even as a fiction writer, I can't make something like this up. Um, it's a survivalist training weekend in North Carolina. And I learned about the precarious crossover from fear that protects us to dangerous delusion that can spur violence. So the queen bee of the Feller family, Grace, travels in apocalyptic prepper circles and she comes dangerously close to trading responsibility for romance. Um, as, as Jeff said, my name is Melissa Scholes Young and I was born and raised in Hannibal, Missouri. Um, my Midwestern roots are in all of my work. My first novel, Flood, is a reimagining of Tom and Huck's famous Friendship as Female. I'm a first generation college student, and my family still runs a tri state pest control business in the Midwest. So, family business dynamics were pretty fantastic fodder for the hive. Um, I'm honored to share the hive with you, and I'm grateful that early reviewers have supported it well. 
St. Louis Magazine featured the hive as their next read this and wrote that the feller women are resilient and resourceful in their story of sisters and survival. A reviewer from Shelf and Bound wrote, I know a book is good when I wake up at 4 a.m. on a Sunday and pick up where I left off, a front row seat to the challenges families face in a small town in Midwest America. But perhaps it's booksellers like you that, that say it best. Um, Pamela Klingerhorn, a Valley bookseller and creator of the Literature Lovers Night Out, wrote that the Feller clan does everything it can to protect the hive. It is not until their father dies that the bug girls can fully complete their metamorphosis. The hive has so many things that a reader looks for in a novel, great characters and musings on family dynamics, feminism and grief. The hive is the family saga I've been waiting for. And Mary Weber O'Malley at Skylark endorse the hive as a rich and complex family narrative. Imperfect, real, and true to life characters are presented in a page turning story that book clubs will devour. Um, the hive will be published June 8th by Turner Publishing under the Key Light Books imprint. And the hive was immediately optioned for the screen by Sony Entertainment. So fingers crossed that Hollywood gets back to work soon. Um, if your bookstore would like autographed book plates, we are happy to send those your way. I'm also sending these beautiful artist designed postcards, beautiful bookmarks that Dust Jacket Reviews, uh, who's one of my favorite bloggers, made as, uh, as a thank you for pre-orders and the details are at thehivenovel.com. Uh, my summer book tour schedule is almost full, but if you have a book club or a reading series, um, I'd love to come talk about The Hive with you. Um, I know that we've shared links for you to order an ARC, but if you're finding your TBR pile too high, I've also recorded a mini audio ARC of the first few chapters, and my team at Turner, Turner would be happy to share it with you so that you can meet the, the Feller family. Um, I'm grateful for your time. Cheers for more coffee. Um, I'm grateful for what you do, and I hope you can buzz for the high. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Sounds fantastic. Great job. Next from Imagination Press and the American Psychological Association, we have Jacob's School Play starring he, she, and they. And here to tell us about it are Ian and Sarah Hoffman. Welcome. Hey there. Hi everybody, I'm Ian Hoffman. Hi, I'm Sarah Hoffman and Ian and I are the authors of Jacob's School Play starring he, she, and they, which came out on Tuesday from Imagination Press. Happy birthday. It's our third book in the Jacob series. Our first book, Jacob's New Dress, is about what happens when a little boy wants to wear a dress to school. And Jacob's New Dress is number 72 on the American Library Association's list of the 100 most banned and challenged books of the decade. And it's sold over 20,000 copies. Our second book, Jacob's Room to Choose, tackled the timely subject of kids being allowed to use the bathroom that is right for them, whatever their gender. Jacob's, Jacob's Room to Choose won awards from Forward Reviews and the Children's Book Council, and was also selected for the 2020 Rainbow Book List by the American Library Association. In our new book, Jacob's School Play, starring he, she, and they, Jacob and his friends are back and they are ready to put on a school play. As the kindergartners prepare costumes and sets for their play, Jacob is confused because his classmate, Ari, identifies as they instead of he or she. Sorry, slide. No, 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 sorry. Okay, sorry, my fault. <laughs> the more Jacob thinks about Ari, the more he feels like he doesn't understand. Jacob is a boy who wears dresses, so he's okay with Ari wearing whatever they want. But someone who's not a boy or a girl, that's totally outside of Jacob's experience. So luckily, Jacob's teacher sees his confusion, and she helps Jacob find new ways of thinking about Ari. She tells him that from the outside, we can't see who anybody is on the inside, so we have to trust people when they tell us. She also teaches him that there are pronouns for everyone. The kids finish making their costumes and learning their lines. Finally, the big day arrives and Jacob and his friends are ready to perform their play in front of their families. Watching his classmates on stage, something clicks for Jacob and his unanswered questions resolve. Unfortunately, Jacob's realization 
comes at the expense of him remembering his own lines. Not knowing what else to say, Jacob speaks his new truth, which works for everyone. He, she, and they. So we know that as booksellers, you are searching for books that serve as mirrors and windows and sliding glass doors. Jacob's School Play, starring he, she, and they, introduces kids to the idea that there are many ways to experience the world and that every person fits in their own way. So Matthew Winner of the Children's Book Co Podcast had this to say about Jacob's School Play. Do we need anything? Making space for everyone is no small task. Seeing one another, asking the right questions, and honoring how each person walks through the world is something learned, but not often enough taught. This is not a book about conflict or being accepted by others for who you are. It's about classmates each embracing that their experience is not the only experience, and that every person fits beautifully in this world in their own way. I'm so grateful that children in every classroom will have the opportunity to see themselves and their friends represented in Jacob's school play starring he, she, and they. That's so needed and so beautifully done in this book. I never noticed that Matthew Winner used the word beautifully twice in that review. I'm so <laughs> touched. So we hope you'll check out Jacob's School Play starring he, she, and they. We're here virtually in our local independent bookstore in San Francisco, Folio Books. And if you like our books, we would love to come visit you either virtually or in person soon, we hope. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, bye. Thank you, Hoffmans, uh, and uh, love for love that you teed us up with some uh, indie bookstore uh, talk there. We will definitely be coming back to our favorite indie bookstores at the end for our Q and A. Uh, next up, we have a book that I have a personal connection to, and I'm really excited to read uh, from Harper Collins. We have *The Comfort of Monsters*, a novel by Willa C. Richards. Take it away, Willa. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm Will Richards, um, author of The Comfort of Monsters. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me and um, for this opportunity to introduce my book to you all. This is my first book event, so I'm, I'm really excited. And this is my first novel, too. Um, so The Comfort of Monsters is really a story of sisterhood for me. Um, it's also a lot about loss um, and how we live with uncertainty and with the unknown. Um, and it's also very much about the failability of our memories. Um, a large portion of the novel, about half, takes place in the city of Milwaukee during the summer of 1991. So um, this was the summer that the city was really consumed by the discovery of and the fallout from Jeffrey Dahmer's crimes. Um, and news of these crimes really spread across the globe, um, plunged Milwaukee into an intense and, and very unkind spotlight. Um, and news crews were flown in from across the world. Um, and the city really became a, a media circus. And this, this circus had real consequences on the prosecution of the crimes, on the, on the people that lived there, witnesses were harassed, uh, documents were stolen. Um, and of note for my novel too, um, were the ways that at the time the media really went to extraordinary lengths to give this, this heinous serial killer a very humanizing, forgiving narrative. Um, he was sort of excused for his crimes for all of these different reasons. Um, and and um, meanwhile, the media was very intent on holding responsible his, his non-white victims for their own deaths. Um, reporters called them sort of facilitating victims because they live these lives of, of sexual deviance and risk, right? Um, and this is something we still see today. Um, if you're not white, wealthy, straight, you can really quickly become lost in, in your own story, except as, as culpable for your death, right? So um, with my novel against this very fraught backdrop of 1991, we have my narrator, Peg McBride, um, and she's age 20 at the time, and she's sort of recalling the summer of 1991, uh, which to the rest of the world, like I said, was really the summer of Dahmer in Milwaukee. But to Peg, it's ultimately the summer that she lost her own sister, Dee, who was age 19 at the time, to an unrelated and unresolved crime. Um, and in these sections of the book, Peg is really trying to understand what happened to Dee, investigating, curating her own memories surrounding her sister's disappearance. And by the end of the summer, Dee's case has really gone completely cold. It's been swallowed up by the intense media firestorm surrounding Dahmer. Um, and then we have the second section of the book, which takes place 30 years later, 2019. Dee is still missing and um, Peg's mother is now dying. And she's really desperate to find out what happened to her daughter um, so that, you know, they could potentially find her body and she could be buried with her. Um, so the family in this 
in this place decides to hire a celebrity psychic to investigate. Um, and this particular endeavor really troubles Peg's own recollections, complicates her understanding of what happened that summer. So um, I have three sisters myself. I grew up in a big family and I really wanted to explore the intense intimacy of sisterhood, um, how these relationships change, grow, get renegotiated as we, as we move through our lives. And I also really wanted to write a page turner. You know, these were the books I loved growing up, staying up all night reading them, regretting when I finished them too quickly. Um, and so I really wanted the comfort of monsters to have that pulse quickening element to the plot. Um, and I wanted to use the propulsiveness of that plot to explore some of the issues I'm really invested in, um, intense familial relationships and sex and sexuality, violence, and particularly the intersection of the institution with the individual. Um, and overlaying the, the Dahmer crimes with Dee's case really allowed me to explore not necessarily like the gruesomeness of his particular crimes, but what people were really saying when they were talking about this kind of violence, uh, this kind of killer and these kinds of victims. Um, and ultimately the novel was just a really great opportunity to explore the city of Milwaukee um, where I was born, went to school. Um, it's a very troubled city, a very segregated city, uh, but it's a city that I love very much and isn't represented on the page all that often. So I'm excited for that. So um, I really hope the book engages lovers of true crime, of mysteries and page turners, as well as those who, who love character studies and unreliable narrators. So thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Willa. Uh, I am definitely interested. Uh, as I said, I do have a connection. I was uh, growing up there at the time also, so I remember it well. And uh, you're right, we don't see uh, Milwaukee on the page that often. So I know others that are looking forward to checking out your story. Now we have Bean Clem from Holiday House Publishing and author Lisa Klein Ransom. Lisa, tell us about your book. Hi, Jeff. Uh, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Carrie, for inviting me to be here today. And it's a pleasure to be here with Miva, especially given that I have spent so much time immersed in the history of Chicago and Milwaukee with the research for the um, Finding Langston Trio. And I'll just uh, show you a little bit of the, this is the first and second books in the Finding Langston Trio trilogy. So um, we first meet Clem, and this is um, being Clem. Here. We first meet Clem in 1946 at Haines Junior High School in my debut novel, Finding Langston, when he appears as one of the title characters, Schoolyard Bullies. But uh, through shared grief and the love of the library, Clem slowly transitions to Langston's first friend in Chicago. But now, in being Clem, we see him at the center of his own story and the final book of the Finding Langston tr trilogy. So Clem is funny and he's smart and he's likable, but he's also really worried that he can never live up to the legacy of a father who died during the Port Chicago disaster, the tragic naval base explosion that killed hundreds of black servicemen who were loading ammunition at a base in the San Francisco Bay during World War II. Um, he's trying hard to cheer up his grieving mother and fend off attacks uh, from his two teenage sisters, Annette and Clarice. He's scared to death of the very thing he's supposed to love, and he hates that everyone continues to treat him like a baby. Uh, he's Clemson Thurber Jr. to his mother. He's Clementine to his sisters. He's CJ to his cousins. Clem to his friends, Errol and Lyman. But Clem isn't quite sure which one of these he really is. He knows that being Clemson Thurber Jr. means that he's supposed to be some version of his sailor father, strong and brave, but it's hard to be some, like someone that you can barely remember. So I, I started writing this book because at a time in our nation when, when black boys are painted as, uh, as violent and dangerous, I wrote this series as a way to provide readers with a portrait of the black boys that I know. Black boys like my son, Malcolm, um, who are vulnerable and sensitive and curious and complex, who are often also exploring issues of identity and acceptance, grief and healing in equal measure. So much like the previous companion novels, Finding Langston and Leaving Lyman, 
Um, Chicago, Milwaukee, and the Great Migration are a backdrop for uh, the powerful events that shape these characters and reveal how the painful truths of history shape not just Clem and his family in 1946, but they're also shaping each one of us today. Um, we watch Clem navigate his friendships and his fears and his future, but will Clem ever figure out how to be happy with just being Clem? Thank you so much for having me here. And um, I hope that this that Clem will find a way into your bookstores and into the hearts of readers. Thanks, Lisa. Sounds like another one I need to check out. Next, from Andrews McMeal Publishing, we have Call Me Athena, Girl from Detroit by Colby Cedar Smith. Colby, take it away. Hi, I'm Colby Cedar Smith, and I am a poet and a novelist. And my YA historical debut, which is a novel in verse called Call Me Athena, Girl from Detroit, will be out um, on August 17th. And it's been pitched for fans of Elizabeth Acevedo, as well as Ruta Sepetis, who also gave some advanced praise for the book, which I'm so grateful for. And I want to first say that um, I'm so honored to be here because I used to be a bookseller at Wordsworth Books in Boston, and also a community relations coordinator that coordinated author events. And I was able to eat, meet so many of my heroes like Toni Morrison and Eliz or, um, Isabella Allende during that time. And that's where my writing life really truly began. Um, and also when I realized that bookstores and libraries um, are the foundations for community and intellectual pursuit, empathy and tolerance in America. And these were really my literary goals when uh, I was writing my book, Call Me Athena, Girl from Detroit. This is an extremely personal story for me. It's based on um, my grandmother, Mary Scandalaris, who was the daughter of Greek and French immigrants in Detroit, Michigan in the 1930s. In the book, Mary struggles with um, how to find her path as an American woman while clashing with her parents over issues of arranged marriage and also yearning to grow beyond one's own culture. This book is told from her perspective, but also has flashbacks to her parents' life in Greece and France at the end of World War I when they were also 16. These profoundly different narrators all have one wide reaching message, which is that it takes courage to fight for tradition and heritage while forging a new future. I find great resonance and resilience in multi-generational stories that try to bridge the gap between the past and the present. And even though this is a historical novel, I believe that the themes that are present in the book, identity, freedom, equality, feminism, and hope are themes that will resonate with readers today. I wrote this book after my grandmother had struggled with Alzheimer's for years and passed. And I wrote this to record the stories that captivated me when I was a child. As I was writing, the story spilled out of me in poetry, um, which has always been a healing art form for me and always how my spirit expresses itself. I learned that novels in verse are the most magical forms. Um, each page takes an emotional turn and is really a story within a story. It, the form was able to carry the weight of my grief for my grandmother. Um, an early review said the essence of this story is really a love story, and that's so true. It is a love story between two people who choose each other, and also a love story between close sisters and for parents to their child. It's also a, the story of one woman learning to love herself. But really, this is a love note for my grandmother that I wrote for my grandmother and also the city of Detroit, the city that made her. So thanks for 
having me. I'm so honored to be here and I can't wait for you to read it. <laughs> Thanks, Colby. Kashmira Shet is here to tell us about Nina Sony, Master of the Garden from Peachtree Publishing Company. Kashmira, hi. Hello, thank you so much, Jeff and Carrie and the Midwest booksellers. Um, I'm so uh, thrilled to be here with all these amazing authors. Nina Sony, Master of the Garden is the book I'm going to be talking about today. This is a third book in Nina Sony series. I was born and raised in India and I came here to the United States to go to college when I was 17. Uh, I met my husband here and um, we raised a family in Madison, Wisconsin. So Midwest is where we stayed most of our life. I have two daughters and so uh, as I was writing other books, I had this idea. How about writing a book about two Indian American girls who were born and raised in this country in Midwest? And that's how Nina Sony came about. Nina Sony is of course, Indian American second generation, but she's more than that. She's an older sister. She's a list maker. She has many ideas and she's a little scatterbrained. So she tries to keep her thoughts together with her list, but she doesn't always succeed because she's a little forgetful too sometimes. She's good at mental math and she is a good big sister. Each of the Nina Sony books are about Nina's growth. She's a fourth grader, so there's a lot to learn, not just about herself, but about the world around her. And the first book, Nina Sony, Former Best Friend, is something that makes her realize that friendship is more complicated than she thinks. She is best friend with Jay, a boy she has known even before she was born. And so sometimes she thinks that he's not her friend, really. But in this book, she learns more about friendship than what she thought she knew about. In Nina Sony, Sister Fixer is a book where Nina is little irritated by her sister being always so full of life and singing all the time. Kavita, her little sister, makes up songs. And then, as you can see, Nina Sony, Master of the Garden, the book that just came out uh, this spring, is about Nina working on a garden. The beginning of the book, Nina has great ideas about her garden. She thinks her garden will be beautiful. There will be birds and butterflies and smell of nice gentle rain falling on her garden. Well, she's a little disappointed when there is a whole stretch of really rainy weather. There are rabbits, there are mosquitoes, there are slugs, all kinds of things that come with the garden. And she learns a lot at the end. I wanted to write this book, not just for the childhood um, that I witnessed as my kids grew up, but about immigrant experience. What the kids, especially the second generation immigrant kids have in common and in common with, the, with all the kids that are growing up here. There may be, in this book, there may be some Hindi words, the food may be a little different, but they have the same thing, worries about friendship, about how things are at school, about, you know, wanting to make sure that they don't disappoint um, their parents by doing something wrong, which Nina does. All these things are universal and um, Nina deals with all that in this book. I'm very fortunate to uh, write the Nina Sony fourth book. It will come out in the fall called Nina Sony Halloween Queen. And I'm actually working on the fifth one. So uh, as Nina- Thanks, Kashmira. I'm happy. Sounds great. 
Thank you. Next up, we have from Heart Drum, Harper Collins, Jojo McCoons, the used to be best friend. Dawn Quigley, tell us about Jojo. Oh, bonjour. I mean, everybody, um, it's great to be here. I'm so excited. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, the Twin Cities metro area. So I love hearing about all of our Midwest connections. So uh, Jojo McCoons, the used to be best friend, uh, it, uh, the book birthday is Tuesday. And so you can see that I have matching earrings um, because native women love our, our uh, Nate, uh, our beaded bling. And so I am a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe, and so that's in North Dakota. And I was also a, a, a teacher for 18 years, and I was also in at Indian education. And one of the things that um, uh, I really love writing is because I really want to present um, contemporary Native children in books. Uh, like I always say, Native people are still here. We, um, we go to Target, you know, and so it seems so simplistic, but it's really important for me to write that in my book. And so this book, Jojo McCoons, is the first in a series from a heart drum, and it's actually the first Native American um, uh, character series book as a chapter book series. So it was really the idea was really born out of rejection. And so I had a picture book I was trying to pitch and rightly so it was rejected. And so my native author friend and mentor, Cynthia Lydic Smith said, hey, Dawn, would you ever think about writing a chapter book? And I said, I can't write a chapter book. I, can I write a chapter book? And then pretty soon this little girl, Jojo McCoons started walking around in my mind. She's a seven-year-old Ojibwe girl on a um, fictional Midwestern reservation. And she has uh, two best friends. Her first best friend is her cat Mimi at home. And her second best friend at school, Fern, doesn't seem to want to be friends with her anymore. And so Jojo, as a seven-year-old, interprets how to go about getting more pals. And so she is, um, she loves her Ojibwe language and she loves to draw. And so when her teacher, and she calls him teacher, by the way, that's what my kindergarten students used to call me, just teacher. So um, it's a little bit about my experience as a parent and teacher as well when I wrote this. But it's, the teacher says it's time for language arts. And so Jojo is excited. So she wants to speak Ojibwe and she starts drawing. And the teacher says, no, Jojo, that, that's not right. And so um, she misinterprets things a lot. She, there's a big, um, great group of uh, children that she interacts with. And so um, I like to um, describe this as uh, readers who would love Lola Levine, but I really describe it as um, Jojo is Judy B. Jones, but on the res. <laughs> so, so she's quirky, um, she's really fun. And so I really hope that Jojo finds her way into the bookstores and especially into the hands of all children native and non-native. And so it's actually an Amazon book of the month this month. So I'm really excited. And so um, I hope that everybody will help me celebrate and help Ju um, Jojo on Tuesday with her book birthday. So miigwech, thank you everybody. Go Jojo. All right, Chronicle Books brings us Inside Cat, illustrated by Brendan Wenzel. Brendan, tell us about Inside Cat. Hello, good people of Neba. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to be here. Um, so my new book is called Inside Cat, and I'm going to be working from uh, my proofs today. So I apologize if it gets a little a little awkward logistically. All right, so. This is the book jacket of Inside Cat. And so we see this cat's face and it's, it's, right, it's right up in your face. And when you take the book jacket off, this is what you see on the book case. Um, and so we have our protagonist here in the window. And if you'll notice, this building has a very interesting shape to it. So when we open our book, the very first thing we see are the book's end papers. And we see the protagonist again in the window. 
and you can see the structure of this building. You can see all these rooms and most importantly, you can see all the windows. We punch in a little bit more and we see inside cat and they are sitting by the window looking out at this flower. The refrain for inside cat is, inside cat knows many windows, finds a view wherever it goes. We see our cat wandering the hallways of the building. And again, we see our windows. Wanders, wonders, gazes, gapes, sees the world through many shapes. Um, and so this book is a little bit long to read in four minutes, but I will give you the, the shortened version. So as we move through, we see that inside cat is looking through these windows and many things affect the world that Inside Cat sees. So at first we see Inside Cat looking through shapes and some windows are narrow and some windows are wide and cut things off. Um, some windows are down in the floor and some are up in the ceiling. Windows also come in different conditions. So we see a window that's dusty. We see a window that's streaky and Inside Cat making some art on the window. We see a gloomy window in an apartment that's decorated for Halloween. And we see this really, really bright, colorful window. And I had a lot of fun in this book hiding all these Easter eggs and playing with the, the kind of framework of the book so that things that appear in the space in one scene will pop up again later sort of inside cat, in, within Inside Cat's imagination. So here's a bubbly window. We have a cracked window, a window covered by a shade and an open window. The other thing that affects what Inside Cat sees is, of course, how the world comes to Inside Cat. And as we move through the book, we realize that a lot of the things that Inside Cat sees are being kind of misinterpreted once they reach Inside Cat's imagination. So here we have Inside Cat looking out the window and seeing this construction worker. And as we look down, we can see what Inside Cat is imagining is unfolding outside that window. Here we see Inside Cat looking at a construction worker climbing up a ladder. And then we see where Inside Cat imagines that person is going. Inside Cat is staring out the window at some, some children on a seesaw. And we see who Inside Cat imagines at the other end. Um, and so I had so much fun playing with this sort of interplay between our character, the structure of the building, and then the world outside and how those, th how those three things bounce off each other. And it was really fun creating this character out of loose line because I could kind of play with it and make the cat really respond to the world around it um, in a much more expressive way than I could with just a blocky colorful shape. So the book finally ends or towards the end, uh, we have the world being almost entirely constructed by inside cat's imagination. So here we have their cat and everything around it. And our last, two spreads in the book say, every window, every floor, all the windows, world and more, top to bottom, head to toe, nothing more for you too. And we have this doorway. And inside cat says, oh. And as we zoom out, we see the world around inside cat for the first time in full color with the sun coming back, coming up in the background and everything is revealed to Inside Cat. And so I'm really happy with this spread, but one of the things that I love to do with books is always, at, always leave um, my young readers with an opportunity to sort of continue the creative process, to ask questions of their own, to explore more. And so I wanted to really do that with Inside Cat. And one of the- Thank cool you, Brendan. Oh, we got sorry. it. That's all right. We'll come back at, for Q and A. Thank you. Thanks y'all. All right, our final author is Nick Butler with Godspeed from G.P. Putnam Sons Penguin Publish Publishing Group. Nick, please tell us about Godspeed. Hey, good morning, everyone. First off, I want to thank Miva so much for inviting me to join this event this morning and all the independent booksellers that have been supporting my career since even before Shotgun Love Songs came out. I really appreciate you. And I'm looking forward to a time when I can see everybody again in person. Um, so Godspeed, the idea for Godspeed came to me a few years ago. A uh, close family friend of mine 
and I were talking and he was telling me, he's a construction worker and he was telling me about a multi-million dollar house that he was working on south of Eau Claire near where I live. And he and the rest of the guys on his crew um, had fallen behind their schedule. And the homeowner got everybody together on the crew and said, look, I'll offer you all a five figure bonus if you can get this house finished in the next uh, three weeks. And my buddy turned to me and said, uh, Nick, if we had all the meth in the world, we couldn't get that house finished in three weeks. And I just thought, that seems like an amazing idea for a novel. And really, at that point in time, I started asking myself a lot of questions like, uh, what sort of, why would the homeowner need to push that sort of uh, time limit? And what are the kinds of men that are working on this sort of project? And what if rather than not taking her up on that, what if they what if they did take her up on that offer? And what if instead of a five figure uh, bonus, it was a six figure bonus? And what if the guys did start using meth when they slipped behind their own timeline? So I had this idea for sort of a literary thriller um, and it had been bouncing around in my head for a long time, but um, Somehow I, I didn't feel like, you know, normally I write about Wisconsin, rural Wisconsin, but I didn't feel like that was quite the right landscape for, for this book. And a couple of years later, my family and I took a trip out west uh, and we drove through Jackson, Wyoming. And I suddenly knew exactly where the book needed to be set. Um, here you have this exclusive tourist community where you really get to see the great wealth uh, inequalities of America. And I began thinking about the time here and the new people that are pushing into Jackson and um, what's even possible for blue collar normal people living in a community sort of like that. I also love the fact that Jackson gave me the ability to um, really push the, the sort of uh, drama of the seasons. Um, so it was a way to sort of amplify everything within the plot, uh, weather, time, uh, money. Um, and the book really asked the question, you know, uh, how far would you go uh, to sort of push your family ahead and your, your career ahead? Um, so in some ways, this is a slightly different book for me. Um, it's placed outside of the Midwest but the themes are very familiar to people who have read my books. Um, there's four main characters. Three of them are childhood uh, male friends. Um, the fourth is a rather mysterious uh, female uh, corporate attorney who is the homeowner. Um, but the book is about friendship and love and ambition and blue collar work. Um, and I think it's just gonna be uh, a real treat for readers and booksellers. It's gonna come out late July. And I think anybody who's interested in reading uh, an intelligent thriller uh, is gonna love it. The reader's gonna know that something bad is gonna happen, but they'll never know who it's going to happen to or when it's gonna to happen to. So there's sort of that element of uh, being right along with the guys working on this site and having to turn pages because you're right there with them uh, as they work towards this, this kind of deadly deadline. Uh, but anyway, thanks again for allowing me to join you this morning. I really appreciate it. And uh... thank you, Nick. Speaking of deadlines. Okay, this is great. Now opening it up to the whole group. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna start with something positive asking all the authors here. What are some uh, positive aspects of the pandemic? of this new normal that actually were more beneficial to you as authors? Can anyone speak to um, maybe the good things that worked for you as an author over this past year or so? Feel free, anyone. I think the accessibility, it's changed events. Um, I live in a place where parking is always a problem and I'm finding that more readers can come to events because they're um, more accessible. It's been a real positive. We agree with that. We've actually had a lovely time visiting schools and libraries on Zoom and places that we wouldn't so easily be able to get to. Um, and it's, it's been a real blessing. Yeah, Plus, Ontario is a long way from San Francisco. Yeah. 
plus mm -hmm. more family time. That's my personal benefit. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, I did not have to commute. I could just pop in, um, have my slippers on and do some book events. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to do school visits um, around the, the, the US. So that was great. I'll, I'll echo I'll echo everyone else's is that you know there's I've been able to travel throughout the country without taking off my leggings which I've, I've had on since last March but you know just to travel throughout this country and also I have to say the lack of having to get on a plane every single week has made me more productive in my own work and it helped me to focus on my characters and I think in, in essence improved my writing so that's been very helpful to me personally. I think in the beginning, I found it hard to to connect via Zoom and things. But as time went by, I think I find it really easy to pop in and out and do it and save a lot of time and not go through airports and all that security and everything. So yeah, it has been very beneficial. Yeah, I would echo too. I think in some ways the scheduling has been a bit easier. Like I've been able to um, schedule things with friends that I don't know that I would have because, um, you know, we're in different time zones. And um, so the ability to like re reconnect via Zoom with people that I might not have been able to do events with if the pandemic wasn't happening. So that's, that's a big plus. My writing buddy moved across the country. He moved from Denver over to um, uh, somewhere in Pennsylvania. And we, we were able to keep writing together so we would just mm -hmm. meet and not talk and we would both have our little squares on the screen and we'd write but it was great <laughs> we could have done that before but we didn't know about zoom so uh so we've been writing we've kept up our writing sessions i have a lot of people in my family um zooming at the same time so usually i would feel like i have to show up at my desk and this is this is my desk where i usually write my books but my positive moment was that i got to write covered with my down blanket in my bed and not feel guilty <laughs> uh i completely agree with everything everyone's been saying and i just wanted to second that the the digital school visits have been fantastic and and being able to uh very quickly and easily connect with children um, that uh, both in the United States, but also wonderful places like Shanghai, China, um, and, and and just, you know, reach out in the morning, have a great energizing chat, and then get back to the studio right afterward, kind of enables this creative process that I've never been able to experience before. So it's been, it's been fantastic. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Well, moving forward, hopefully we remember all of the things that we're positives and keep the positives moving forward and just reincorporate that as we move back into real life situations uh, and can actually see each other at our favorite indie bookstores. Does anyone have any favorite indie bookstores in their area that they want to give uh, plugs or shout outs to? It's Thanks for, uh... <laughs> Mystery to me in Madison. I would say Birch Park Books in Minneapolis. Here in the, oh, sorry about that. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. Um, Folio Books in Noe Valley, where we're sitting right now. We went into Sign Books yesterday, and they're just the loveliest people there. We, have, I mean, we've been in there a million times, but you can't go in the bookshop now. It's not open, so they let us in to sign books people had ordered, and it was so much fun. And we also have Books Inc., Dog Eared. We have so many. Oh, Green Apple. We have amazing independent booksellers in San Francisco, and we love them all. We've got I feel like I have two hometowns. Oh, sorry, Jenna. Go ahead. I was just going to say the book bar in addition. It's a fabulous place here in Denver. I feel like I have two hometowns. My my home, my Missouri bookstore is Left Bank um, and Skylark, of course. And I'm out in DC. So Politics and Prose is hosting my launch. I love loyalty in East City out here too. But we have 11 in DC. And I saw every one of them on Independent Bookstore Day. And it was the best way to come out. Um, and, and uh, sidewalk sales and be able to see booksellers again. It, um, I couldn't hug anyone, but I could um, <laughs> mask and high five everyone. We had a beautiful, beautiful day. So anything we can do to be outside and, and see booksellers again is, is an honor. Um, I wanna shout out Boswell's in Milwaukee. It's where I'm gonna be doing my first events and I'm really excited. Um, I love the staff there. I've loved the bookstore. Um, and then also Prairie Lights in Iowa City, which is like a, a second bookstore home for me. Gonna, oh, oh, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead. I'm going to uh, shout out um, Oblong Books in Rhinebeck, New York, 
and uh, Frugal Books in uh, Roxbury, Massachusetts. I'm from Massachusetts, but I live in Rhinebeck, but both stores are great. My favorites in my area are the Bear in the Book, which is this tiny, tiny shop and so lovely. And um, it's in Hopewell, New Jersey. And then in Princeton, Labyrinth Books and also Jazam. There's too many great bookstores for me to even mention. I live in rural Wisconsin, so I don't have like a neighborhood bookstore. And that's one of the reasons why I really love when a new when I publish a new book because I get to travel around the cities and get to visit different bookstores. So I'm really just looking forward to some sense of normalcy and getting to see everybody again. Well, Nick, uh, you're not too far of a drive from three of my favorites in the Twin Cities. You could try, you've, I know you've been Majors and Quinn, Moon Palace, yeah. and Subtext Books in downtown St. Paul. Those are three I'd like to give a shout out to. They've all sponsored books and bars over the years. So um, we have a wealth of beautiful ones in the Twin Cities. Um, maybe one last question, if anyone would like to speak to um, what are some of your favorite stories, books, um, writers that have influenced your own writing? Is there anyone who would like to take that question? Any favorites that have inspired you that you'd like to share? I'm from Hannibal, Missouri. So this seems an unfair question um, because when you grow up with Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens all around, um, I'm a big fan. But Joan Didion's The Year of Magical Thinking is actually the book that I was reading and, and processing so much about grief when I was, I, when I was writing The Hive. I can answer. <clears throat> um, so when I was writing my first novel in verse, it, it's such a unique form um, that I read all the novels in verse that I could get my hands on. And I was very inspired by um, Tan Han Lai's book, Inside Out and Back Again. And um, also Karen Hess's book, Out of the Dust, which takes place in the, um, in, you know, the era of the depression in the United States, which is also um, the backdrop for my book. And also Ruta Sepeti's Salt to the Sea, which is not a novel in verse, but she's, her words are so poetic. And um, the three of those very much informed the writing of my book. Uh I'm a picture book illustrator, so I'm going to throw a curveball and uh, shout out a very recent book, uh, Beyond Words by Carl Safina, which is about animal intelligence. And it's had an enormous effect on me over the past few years and how I think about um, animals and how I think about making stories about animals. So, um, yeah, thanks. I, I don't have one single book, but uh, as when my children were growing up, I read with them because I hadn't read anything in, you know, in children's literature. And all those books, whether they were classic, you know, Laura Ingall Wilder series and the Green Gables to, you know, um, uh, books like um, Wrinkle in Time, all that really helped me think about writing and wanted to share my story then. So they inspired me. George Eliot, her insight on human behavior has, has always uh, motivated me. And, and I wish I could write more like Lionel Shriver too. I just love her, her sharp wit so much. I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna be in for uh, Toni Morrison, uh, Octavia Butler and Kenta Roof. I, I absolutely love those words are just poetry. I feel like this is an unfair question for people who write picture books because like there are so many of them. How could you ever pick 15 or 40 that you know were the most influential? Do you want to say one? <laughs> Not even. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just jump in and say that um, you know, I can't pick one, but one of the things that it's it's such an honor to be a part of. Um, the really burgeoning native kid lit community. And so, um, and then in addition to that, being a writer, I think that every book that I read, I never, I never got an MFA or anything. Um, every book has been my writing teacher. So. I've lost track if everyone answered. Are there any more answers lingering around here? Nick might be an answer. Well, <clears throat> 
I guess I got to give a shout out to my old teacher at Iowa, James Allen McPherson, um, who showed me like as a what it, what it looks like to be not just a writer, but a like a great human being and who is criminally underread um, and was a great Midwesterner. Well, thank you, everybody. This just goes to show you how we um, are more inventive with the pandemic. This wouldn't have happened otherwise. All of you in one place together like this in the morning for coffee. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for preparing your remarks. We had a huge number of submissions for these events. So you are really hand selected um, as authors whose books we think will do well in independent bookstores and who have important messages. I wanna say thank you to Kate as well. I think she has four computer screens up this morning and is navigating this like it's an airplane. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jeff, for being a fabulous host. We've had such a good time with you. Let's do it again sometime soon. Everyone Absolutely. go check out Books and Bars. There's also virtual events. Jeff is picking up the best of the pandemic. He's continuing with virtual events as he transitions into in-person events. Um, and thank you booksellers for joining us. Ask for the galleys, talk about them. Um, authors, I forgot to mention this. Go ahead and ask for galleys if you like. Talk about them online. Take the authors, take the publishers. Uh, galleys are an implicit marketing request from publishers and they love to hear from you. So let's do what we do best and read and share and talk about books. Thank you everyone and we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>